Hey, and welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged. I'm Morgan. You're on. <laughs> That's not a question mark. That's not a. <laughs> but I'm Morgan. Again, am I? Is is this my script? <laughs> yes, you're Morgan. I'm I almost Arna. said I'm oh. Arna, and I was like, "That's not right." <laughs> I'm Arna. I'm Arna. That'd be a surprise. Uh, now you're. That's going to be. That that would be very confusing. No, we're not. And we're just going to keep this, by the way. No. Hey, Morgan. <laughs> Today I'm Morgan. <laughs> Today you're Morgan. Today I am Arna. Um, Arna. And, uh, and we had a great conversation with Mark Stickdorn, the same, the always, the future, the past, Mark Stickdorn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which to me that? was funny because you uh, know the, the book that you mm -hmm. know uh, was such a had such a big impact. Yeah, uh, you know this is sort of thinking. Um, you had it as a textbook. Um, I had it as a text yeah. textbook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I... <laughs> makes me feel so old as well. Uh, yeah, I get to meet my textbook heroes. <laughs> but uh, like, whoever got a textbook, that then you know yeah no it's it's fun no because when the book you know when he was getting that book done when you know um, um and and uh, you know as i had a little part of that as well writing it mm -hmm. and introducing me to the publisher but um um it uh, the idea that somehow along the line people will study that at school is like that was not a thought he had like no. it, that yeah. was not like really like you know, yeah. I'm going to write this book someday, so, yeah. Yeah, because that's such a... I mean, you know, textbooks are, are, there are textbooks written for students, for schools, for, for you know, for, for yeah. academic learning. They are there. You know, people do that. This was not that book. It no. And no. to be a, something to be studied at school. Um, it's, 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 it's really... And if you right. haven't read This is Service Design Thinking, highly recommend. Um, but it's really a guidebook. It doesn't feel like a textbook. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah, it changed so, a lot of things, and we talk about that in the in the episode. Yeah, um, we talk about the past, the present, the future, uh, how we look at that. Yeah, we're back into the future. I love oh. that uh, that that story you you share. Um, yeah, that's that's gonna stay with me for a while. Uh, so yeah, so Mark is an old friend, obviously. Uh, again, so sorry, Morgan. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was very uh, enjoyable. Yes. Yeah, we basically, you know, we met at the start of the whole service on movement in, in, in Europe and uh, and the world, really. And then, uh, you know, the, yeah. So we had we had many, 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 many journeys together and adventures, and, and, and again, yeah, around the world it was kind of funny um, to uh, to see him uh, again because we haven't seen each other uh, because of the pandemic, and you know, everything we kind of moved to. Uh, uh, online and, and yeah. the busy and uh, his company is doing really well and so so you know so life happens um, so really nice having him on the show um, I think he has been and is still one of those people that has been central to this whole movement around service sort of design um, and and you know working differently and uh, he has been one of those really impactful people uh, an organizer a doer a creative leader uh, that is one of the examples of yeah really made an impact uh, by doing these things by setting sort of a sort of a, an, an example of hey you know this is possible or here are some other options and then people go like oh you know that's great I didn't know that and and so you know people listen to him and, and, and see what he does and then uh, you know not always follow his path correctly <laughs> when he goes like no that's not what i meant you know so it's it's a bit like there's a monty python kind of esque moment like uh, you know, <laughs> you know what no yeah, I don't, you know, that scene, yeah. The, the followers of the, the sandal the, but anyway so th there's this this um uh there's this um uh, moment where he had a big impact that still resonates with uh, the, the services on movement and so it's really nice to have him on the show yeah really enjoyed and uh yeah hope you guys enjoy it as well so if if you ask me like professional like what not not who are you but what do you do no. then then i typically say i work with computers yeah that but that's not what we ask we we're not we don't care we don't care about that exactly that's like yeah. really you work for computer yeah uh, you're one of those okay fair enough like I, <laughs> in my in my private life like i i have a pretty 
pretty distinction between my business life and my private life. My business life um, is is anything related to to service design, innovation, journey management, all that stuff, right? And I think that's that's a very different conversation that I'm having then um, compared to with people I meet privately. Like I live in a little village outside of Innsbruck and. When I meet other parents of uh, in, in in the kindergarten and so on, and they ask me, "So who are you?" I'm I'm the German, like I'm, I'm, I'm the, the German dude living in Austria, uh, married to an an Austrian wife, and and that's probably enough. And then if they ask, like, okay, and and what do you do? I work with computers. Ah, and then they they have their their bucket for me, which is the German dude working with computers. Not interesting. Um, we, <laughs> that ends the conversation. That's um. If I want to move on with conversations, then I, um, I rather talk about hobbies and, and stuff we really like to do on the weekend, like going out hiking and and skiing and surfing and stuff like that. You can you can surf in Innsbruck. No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no that is a good. story in itself. They, <laughs> uh, I think it was like twelve years ago. They built something in the river where they thought you could surf, but it never worked. Oh no! Um, that was a really interesting project. Like, um, oh, it's actually, surfing. an interesting story of failed innovation. Yeah, because in Munich, in Munich, they have a spot in the river where you can surf. Yeah, which is quite cool. Yeah, I, really. I, yes, yeah. I tried it. There are actually a few of them. There's there's the famous one in the yeah. in the English Garden, and there there are others uh, a little bit outside of the city, uh, which are not so famous. Um, where oh, I don't know the English name for it. Um, they used to ship wood using um, the rivers, and mm-hmm. to speed up those those, they, they put the wood together into into big uh, platforms, kind of. And oh, okay. to speed them up, they build things into these rivers that um, that, that speeds up the river, and that is making a small wave at uh, at the bottom of it. So it, it's actually enough to go. A li- kind of surfing, right? It's river surfing, completely different to proper surfing. Listen, I've never heard of river surfing. So from my, my brain, brain is going, what are you talking yeah, there's, about? There's like a little wave. It's standing still. The wave is standing and you, you, you're you moving yourself then uh, around there. But the really? funny thing is th- there are tourists now on these big chunks of wood and they still use that stuff. So if you don't take care, um, you might end up with like this big, massive wood thing. Their they're, they're music... Um, like like whole chapels on it, like like people celebrating. It's a big party, and you need, really need to take care not to crash into one of those. It's it's big fun. Wow, that's really cool. This I was younger. I can't do it anymore. Honestly, <laughs> this podcast is taking really weird twists. I uh, so <laughs> so I have to look it up. Sorry, I, this is totally new to me. River <laughs> serving. I think okay. So what? That, no, like you know. So in Innsbruck, they uh, they tried it. Uh, it didn't work. Okay. And um, so okay. But um, so did you? Just so you uh, did you end up in in Austria because of the girl? Uh, no, I met her here. So I moved to Austria in two thousand eight, like sixteen years ago, and. Um, I came here because of a job. I started a job working at the local business school, the management center Innsbruck. And I was working in the tourism faculty there, the the MCI tourism. I I started a job there as, I don't know my my title at that time, uh, research assistant, lecturer and research assistant, I think it was. Uh, The German German assistant. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, seriously, of course, I know this because I, I... you know, that's that's you me. were here quite often. I, 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 yeah, I, I taught some classes there, which was cool. Um, I learned something also at that because I think it was the first time I taught really a class with, with young people. I, I think I it was think, the first time, yeah, I did that. Yeah, so and I, and I think it was actually the first time that service design was taught in yeah. a business school. Yeah, it was the first time. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah, but we are talking about the start of the service on movement. 2008 was really important moment. Um, but I just, I will, we'll come back to this, but but my anecdote for the teaching, but I learned from you, uh, was very on a very practical level uh, of te- about teaching is that, so I was at the time used to facilitating sessions and workshops and stuff like that. So I would, so I remember basically to me, it was like, I, you know, this is, group of people and i'm going to kind of 
you know facilitate some kind of workshop with them as you know uh, not just as a teacher uh but you are it's like you go like crazy because you're so exhausting to spend that time uh all that time just being sort of there present and and so you said arna you can just go out and have a coffee every now and then you know right you know you just you know kind of spread your energy you know, like oh yeah okay yes <laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> all right so no it's really because i i always remember that as a you know if i teach uh you know at a school we go like you know have them do things also a facilitator obviously you know make take care of your own energy as well don't be you know switch on all the time which was actually interesting i um yeah it's a good 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 lesson um, but going back to 2008, because I didn't know, actually now thinking that was because we met in 2008, I thought you were already at the school longer, but actually that's the first year, because when we met in Kuopio, Finland, <laughs> at the school, <laughs> design school where Satu Miten, who was also a part, uh, interviewed in this podcast a long time ago, um, was teaching, um, she kind of wrote this, I think, first book about service design i think it was the yes. first book and she organized a um a seminar for her school and other guests on service design and uh so I'll, I'll tell you my side of the story is that i was asked uh so because it was a really important year that 2008 by the way um because I met you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Also, also because I met you. Um, without, no, I'm not kidding. But because it has, it, I can tie everything back to Satu Mitin about it. My career goes to Satu and then to people like you and, and then other people. That's a great person. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I was there and I, I spoke about service design. You were in the audience and you were going, we've been doing in tourism, in, you know, in tourism, we've been doing this for many, many years. This is nothing new. Nothing new. This is nonsense. <laughs> that's right. Oh, right. And then we, that's and that's where we became friends. That's because I'm like, this is really cool. Florida? Sorry, what? You were like heckling him in the audience? <laughs> no, no, he was well, no, I don't in think in the he... audience and, and everywhere else as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. Did you speak up during my? I don't know. I think I afterwards. Can't remember. No, I don't it's think so. I just remember us sitting next to each other, looking at the other lectures, going, and they were all in Finnish, going like, "What's that? That's like Japanese. It's Finnish, like it has the same." So it's sort of really nice. It, there, it doesn't go up and down a lot like Scandinavian languages go. So that's how we were like, "What are you talking about?" I see. If you picture. don't understand, it's actually getting very tiring. Yeah, like, you, this is, I should record this. this is where you go to sleep. This is amazing. And they, oh, there. And, and oh. I remember we were both complaining that they tricked us because Satu <laughs> claimed yeah. it to be a summer school. It was freezing. It summer was, in Finland is freezing cold. Exactly. Yes, that's true. We and went we were out. doing things outside. Like we had, um, we, we did experience prototyping and it was actually really, really nice. Or oh, was it a oh. year later? I can't remember, but it was in summer then. It was freezing get cold and they, yeah. they put fire pits everywhere so you could warm yourself a little bit and were you there when we when we took the bus they took us on a trip in a bus to yes. a sort of like a open For, space something yeah. i can't remember why we that were was there it. there yeah. was like an open space yeah and and it took like long i don't know for in my mind it was hours in the bus and the only thing <laughs> you could see was trees right? So <laughs> it's trees, 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 and then there was one open space. They're like, "Look, an open space. Let's sit here and do." I can't remember what we did, but it was some. The, it was an old, how do you call it, quarry. Um, yeah, where, yeah, where you take rocks out, and uh, a quarry, yeah, quarry, yes, and they they put in some staged experience oh, with some musicians and yes. a bit of food but it was all freaky cold so it was a prototype they wanted to test if they could use that site for uh, touristic purposes so yeah. they built a prototype of this service and we were the ones experiencing it it yeah. was really really nice and was well yeah. done and and a hat tip oh. to Sato for setting all that up but it was yeah. freaky cold yeah no but uh, but to be honest i always I, I i i was so impressed by the way the the the, the you know the fins the, the the way they kind of absorb and are so uh, sort of you know 
everything that is happening and all these new things and they just absorb it they listen they use it and they start using it and they're so f fast adopting all these things um so and specifically uh, obviously uh, satu but this is where we met and i, I think uh, that time we started having that conversation um and but i didn't know you were because then you invited me to come over to in your your class to kind of do like a, a guest lecturing yeah thing, right so the, the thing is, I was at that time, I was when I when I summarized it really, really shortly, it was like, I felt like a boy opening up a box of toys, because I finally found names for what we were doing already. And I only realized later that that actually was a common pattern amongst many of us. We, we were all doing service design in different fragrances, but we didn't call it like this, right? And it was that year, 2008, when I finally found a community for it, when I found a word for it, and when yeah. I realized that there is actually a process and tools and methods and other people doing it. That was fantastic. Because I, I remember we had long discussions in, in Coropio and over Twitter. Twitter was the thing at that time. Um, yeah. Um, the, the whole core community at that time had long discussions on Twitter. And we were talking about, okay, what, what's new? What's different? And we realized actually there is not so much new, but we finally have names for it. And exactly. we can talk about a thing that we were doing all slightly differently in different industries, in different backgrounds and so on. Yeah, exactly. So did, yeah. You, come, did you come to it then through the tourism industry? Yeah. Okay. So my my background actually is tourism. Like uh, when when I go back, like I I said, I was I was surfing and snowboarding. I was a surf teacher in summer, a snowboard teacher in winter. That's how I financed my studies, <laughs> and I actually studied uh, strategic management in tourism. And I was working in tourism. Like the the first ten years of my professional life, I was working in tourism and doing innovation then there failing really hard uh, trying to do innovation how they teach me at a traditional german business school which basically was write your 80 page uh, business plan and then execute which all like yeah. oh gosh like if i think <laughs> about that horrible and i tried it like this and i failed really hard until i, I learned there are different ways to do it and one thing about tourism which which still primes my thinking is everything is a journey everything is about experience like what you're selling in tourism is an experience is the memories like you're designing tourism products with the intention to create beautiful memories you think about moments that matters which actually is a term that's coming from uh, the travel industry mm. and and a lot of similarities there are and, and a lot of the language we're using when we talk about journeys and maps actually coming from um that part of the world so that was my entry point when I started here. In Instagram, That's what he was saying when I was, he was like, you yeah, know, this is exactly this, 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 all this. News. it all comes from tourism, you know, it's which like... is not true, right? It's, it's not all from tourism, but, but no, yeah. I know. No, no, but you're right. No, but you know what the thing is with tourism uh, and traveling and, and, the, and that, that, that kind of, that like, let's call it a product. Um, if you, that is because it's literally journeys, it makes so much, of course, you're, you're thinking about journeys, but it makes so much more sense if you think about it. So it's such a great way of, uh, it's you know, to make it very simple, because if you talk about journeys and banking, for instance, you know, uh, or insurance or something, you go like, it's very, it, it's, it's, it's very abstract because, you know, you, yeah. you know, what is it? But because the, in tourism, in journeys, and you go, so this, but then even then the whole idea of, um piecing all these bits of a journey together in one journey saying well you 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 know first you book your holiday you pack your stuff you go uh take uh, a car or a taxi to a uh, uh to, to you get take a taxi to a uh, uh an airport and you take the plane and then you go to take a taxi or maybe you rent a car and then you go to a hotel um or you know and then you go, and then you go back again, and you're home. And so these are all separated pieces. And so also in tourism, th th those were always kind of uh, you know things that were kind of taken care of by different organizations. But being mm -hmm. able to kind of design, well, you know, one complete journey, um, or think about it as one complete journey, because if you're 
you know, I, you know, we've I've done some projects for uh, the airport here in the Netherlands, Schiphol Airport, and so if the train would break down uh, to the airport, um, people hated the airport more in the in their numbers in the research because they came in with this bad experience like of having this horrible train delays and stress and stuff. And then Schiphol Airport said, it's not our fault. We, we you know, why, why do we get Airport. like you know, <laughs> bad feedback? It is not, that's, that's the, that's the train company. But this, I, this whole notion of, yeah, but no, that's not the point, you know, to zoom out and look at, you know, the whole experience. So tourism is like, yeah. So I, so I came into service design also without you know, totally in knowing anything really. So, and actually, you came into service design already having a background in that language, yeah, uh, way more than I had. So, I, I was just faking it. And I, I don't, <laughs> and you I were, don't, you were doing it, you know. <laughs> and I don't know how I've never made the connection before, but um, as a as a young kid, I was super super into Walt Disney World and Walt Disney Land and how they designed the whole experience. So go. I didn't care about the movies and the characters. I would go to the library and get the books that said, yeah, there's a secret passage here, or they place the trash cans so far apart to make sure everybody uses them, or they pump smells through the air, all this thing. And that would have been what, like 96, 97 for me. And they were already yeah. thinking about that. And I never made the connection until just now, because that's also a service yeah. to let, yeah. Let's do a little history class. What do you think? When when was the first service blueprint used? Oh, no, maybe uh, not under the name of service blueprint as as Lynn Schustek then established it in nineteen eighty, uh, but it I was eighteen hundred ninety. It was the Ritz whoa. Hotel in New York. Wow! And they Eight, actually made a blueprint about how they lay out the service, uh, which which. Props are involved, wow. which paperwork is involved, like who gets a re like the, the customer gets a receipt, the waiter gets a receipt, the restaurant wow. keeps another receipt for accounting. Like it's fascinating to see that. 1890. That's insane. The Ritz. Is that available? Can you can you is that somewhere is that published somewhere? So I a couple of years later, I um I, I set up this conference, the the service design and tourism conference. And I remember we had a talk there by Kip Lee, Kip Lee, uh, I think it's a Case Western Reserve University where uh, he is still teaching, I think. And he did a talk about that. And um, I've, I've, yeah, there was a paper as well. I'm, it, it's been a while ago, like 12, 13 years ago, but I'm sure I can find it somewhere because he, he pulled it all out about the history of this but, of yeah. map scene the, use. It was fantastic. But I think it's important to because it gives us sort of uh, perspective. Right. Um, and, and so, because, you know, and because we're now we're in this stage of server design and design tech and all that, where we go like, ah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's all passe. It's all done. It's, it's all like, dead. It's, yeah. it's all dead because, uh, you know, but, but if you don't think about it, yeah, but you know, it's, it's been, it's been part of business and, or the human race really forever. How, but just because we gave it a name, or mm -hmm. another name, you can't just say it's gone. Maybe the language changes. Maybe, maybe we can't talk about it in the same w language anymore. But it's how can it? So you know, like so things like you know, eighteen hundred. Um, you know, yeah, but you know, if you everything you um, everything we do, um, uh, it change. It, you know, things happen in very at a very slow pace, really. You know, we think things are going really fast, but I think that uh, we are still stuck in the first industrial revolution, really, because we still have the same uh, organizational structures. We still have the same mental models. We still, wow. There's not such a big difference. We think often, uh, we kid ourselves often, that it, and there is something different. There is something different in culture and the way we relate to work, and for sure there's things changing, but we're also still stuck with those things. So, and I, I can't, rem I should kind of, uh, find out where that there was a there was a uh, I don't know if there was a book or just an article, but it was research done on um, uh, things that were invented at one point. This could be like just simple machines for working the land or something like. Um, and they said there was a, they made a catalog of all these inventions, and they also discovered that none of these inventions disappeared really for you know, like they were always somewhere 
someone was still using it. There, nothing ever disappears. That's sort of like, that was the whole thing. It was like, that's so fascinating. It was sort of about, about machines and things, but it, sort of nothing ever really disappears. It, it, you know, once we invent it, it, it might, you know, be used by a smaller group of people or it just it kind of, it, you know, goes under the surface or something, but it's still there somewhere. And I believe in that, that, that there, it, because it's, 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 we're part of a movement that's bigger and we just try to give it names and, 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 you know, be part of it, but it's not, it has nothing to do with uh, service design or, or design thinking or, right. So. My uh, so your your history lesson uh, um, uh, that, that just uh, a question yeah <laughs> which is good but no but but I I would like to kind of um, um, uh, you know for for you when did you start it uh, I know that's sort of like in two thousand eight and you sort of but then you started teaching service design yeah. in, in at a business school uh, but that was all very new in a way right also for you at the time it so it was yeah because. It, I just learned that this thing exists there in in 2008. I started here in in the winter of 2008, and uh, and and luckily I I had a lot of freedom um, in the faculty to do my own research to learn about that stuff. So uh, a big thank you to my former boss there, to Hubert, who actually gave me this freedom to uh, to learn also what what is this thing because. He just learned about it at, at a conference. And he said, ah, that sounds interesting and sounds like what we're doing. We should actually incorporate that. They were building up their new master programs at that time. They said, let's put it into the curriculum. So now someone needs to teach it. And we have this uh, this German guy here. Let's let him do it. And that's how I ended up with uh, with with under, trying to understand what service design is. So um, the next few years, I really focused on 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 translating what I was doing before into the more universal language of service design. I think that was what many people were doing in 2008. 2008 was um, the year when, when we met in Kuopio, but also where later in the year, I think in fall, the first really service design conference happened. There was the, the SDN conference in, in Amsterdam, uh, where we met again, and um, mm -hmm. where I we saw examples for the first time at that time was like all like like engine and live work and and yeah. birgit marga obviously and and yeah. a few others and and it was really a small community at that time and we yeah. were figuring out all together what is this thing and then my job was teaching it and i tried to teach it for for some time and i realized that i'm I'm pointing towards blog posts and uh, what's a blog post? It wasn't called blog at that time, I guess, um, or, or, or to websites. And, and it, it was really hard to teach. And that's why I said, I, ah, I mean, you mean there was no official articles and stuff like that. There were just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just people writing all... tweets, basically. You were showing tweets the, the, on Twitter. See, he talks about bits yeah. and pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. And that's, true. that's how I started with like, oh, shoot, we need a book. That's that's yeah. how the first book happened because I wanted to have something that makes my life easier in teaching that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because there was no book um, on a very practical. Uh, I mean, Satya's book was there. Because uh, we we both wrote a chapter in it, so it just yeah. happened in two thousand eight. I think it was published then two thousand nine or something. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, so such a book also was a sort of collection of chapters, and I remembered writing um, a chapter on something we basically invented as if it was a service design project. Uh, but we we were trying, and the client was like, "No," and we're like, "Yeah," but you know, so just for the purpose of the book, um, we really wanted to have this out because we. I really believed in it, but there were no real clients because this is the start of stuff. So there were no clients saying, let's do a service on project. So the thing we wrote about was sort of kind of, we twisted it a little bit. So it became a service on project, but the client didn't know it was a service on project because they had no clue what that was and they didn't ask us for it. Um, uh, so so there is a there is a sort of a faking till you make it moment, but because we, we saw it, we we knew it was there, but we were trying to, try to invent it as well at the same time while doing it, <laughs> trying to invent it, right? And so, so yeah, that's such a book. So you're, so um, no, but tell tell us. So you're because that's you know, I I think you know I should write a book, but 
<laughs> it's not like it never happened. So how then what happens? So you're like, yeah, I should write a book. Yeah, there will. Oh, there, that's the personal story and the professional story. Um, so I, we I, like, I tell we like both personal briefly. Yeah, <laughs> um, the profession was, I was teaching service design um, in, in different courses in the master program. There was no established language around service design. So I said, we need a book. And that's why I asked people I knew because the community was so small. We got people together and we wrote a book together. Um, the private story of that is um, Jacob, who I uh, did the book together with, um, is, is a good friend. We actually coming from the same town in Germany. And, um, and, and he was doing his, uh, his, 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 his thing in Germany at that time was called a diploma in design. Um, and his, his professor at that time actually is a friend of Arnold's, uh, Ralph, Ralph yes, yeah. Ralph Volker, yes. And, um, the small world, yes, it is a small world. So he said, well, well, and I met him while he was skiing here. So we we hang out and he said, like, look, I, I want to write a book. And he said, oh, I'm looking for a topic for my for my thesis. So I said, well, how about we join forces, we write the book together, and you can use it as your thesis. But then it's not just a thesis, but actually a thing that is that is useful, because most theses are, frankly, not useful, right? <laughs> they end up in the drawing, no one looks at it again. Yeah. And, and we said, yes, uh, not knowing on what kind of a journey we were about to enter. But then one thing happened in my life that was my, uh, my knees blew up. So I couldn't do sports. I was really into sports at that time. And I couldn't do sports anymore. And, and mm. I needed to channel my energy. I needed to, to get that out somehow. So what I did was instead of sports, Jacob and I spent nights together uh, virtually together, like we were using probably Skype at that time. Mm. And we spent nights and nights and nights working besides our, our day jobs and, and, and university and, and, and like, like getting his, 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 um, his diploma done. Uh, we spent every night writing this book together and that was, that was why it happened. Serendipity. There we are again. Right. Yeah. 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 Which is uh, pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Because your bad knees were the, uh, or not bad knees, well loved knees were the uh, secret <laughs> too, to too much used knees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but exactly. So, the, I mean, that it's interesting. That's a nice, actually, if you, <laughs> that story is like kind of, that's life right there, where you go like, you know, something bad happens and then you can't move and then, and then you write a book and it has such an impact on everything else. And, because it did, I mean, the book had a, a huge impact. Um, it still has somehow. Uh, did we uh, mention the book? Sorry? Or not necessary. I said, should we mention the book, the title nah, of the book? Nah, it's just it's okay. that book. Yeah. book out there. He wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's well, it's an interesting, um, it's, 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 it did so many things uh, on such you know, a very surprising level. Also for me, because, you know, I've, also, I wrote a part, a little thing in the book, and um, I got people. I remember. I mean, we had people coming over to Amsterdam from Japan, taking that book, asking me to put my autograph on the book. I was like, what? "Whoa, rock star!" Yeah, I, well, I just wrote a little bit in it, so you can imagine what Mark kind of uh, must have gone through with that book because <laughs> it it went viral, if you will, right? Um, but it had a clever kind of um, kind of design in the sense that uh, besides it was cleverly designed, but also because there were so many people from the community who were so who also you know there's a community and then if you if if everyone in the community takes part in that is a co-created thing, then everybody starts promoting that and and wanting to have it and and so we would give it to our clients. For instance, we would have like a bunch of them and give it away at, at when we were in the training or something. So, so it, it, that also made sense. But it's also really it was really cleverly done, um, and it's still valid. Uh, uh, although you know, if you're now, even I read it to be honest, if I read my own bit, and I read my own bit every time, every time I go to sleep, I read my own. <laughs> I'm like, what, what did he, what did he say? You're so clever. Oh my god, this is so brilliant. No, I got like no. Big, well, because the reality, there's always a reality because that's the thing, right? But books stay forever. You can't change them. You can't go like, oh, 
that was really, huh. Now I think, so it is interesting because whatever you write is still there. And so I'm kind of, I think it's still okay. I haven't reread it, by the way, seriously, but <laughs> no, but it still is there. And the thing is that it it is a, um, uh, people still point to that book. And then obviously there's the follow-up. Uh, this is, no, we, we are talking about this is surface design thinking, which was a clever thing. It was so it was it was it was stupid. It was, it was a failed experiment. Was it the title? Oh yeah, that that is one of my biggest fuck ups. It's it's that yeah. title of the book. Yeah. Why? Well, uh, well, well, first of all, um, th th that book really changed my life, and and it affected many many people. I didn't yeah. expect that to happen. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, right? Everyone who involved, everyone who was even for even the tiny bits involved somehow wrote like you know a little bit. It affected everyone. So it was it one of my textbooks as a student, by the way. Yeah. Sorry yeah, for no. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but exactly, it became a textbook for students. So it means that you know people, you know, like Morgan, you know, she knew the book, and so there's the people who who kind of you know you, like you who created the book, and and people who were in the book, you know, they became people that people trusted to be experts in that topic. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether, yeah. So anyway, so so change. Let, how let did me tell you the, the story yeah. of my fuck up. That was uh, that was a title. No, yeah. So we we gave it the title. This is service design thinking, and yeah. I, I I I it's somewhere written in the book, and, and 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 I talked about it very often. The reason why we gave it that title was at that time there was a huge discussion in the community. What what is the difference between service design and design thinking? And and with this title, with this combination of the title, I wanted to make sure, like, uh, like I wanted to, to to foster this discussion. Like, it doesn't matter how you call it, right? If, if it's service design, design thinking, use whatever relates to you in in the context you're in. So, in some companies, it's called design thinking; now it's called service design. But if you look at what they're doing, they might do exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter which label you use. But what actually happened with this title is companies started departments for service design thinking. Yeah. Even if they had already teams doing design thinking and teams doing service design, they thought, oh, that's something new. So oh, no. they, oh, in, instead of cleaning it up, I added to the mess. And this is something I, I, I'm personally um, responsible for, and I'm very sorry for creating this mess. It was never to be intended as something new. We just wanted to steer this discussion. Yeah, this is so weird, isn't it? Yes. That, yeah, I mean, the fact that people really do then you change kind of departments and stuff like that based on the title of a book. And then you go like, but Jesus, come on, sorry, <laughs> what's going on? You know. but, but that's that's because it is a book, right? A book yeah, is still a thing. You can't change Especially it. Especially if a book gets... Well, you said viral. I'm not sure if we can still use that word after the pandemic, right? But it's, yeah, it, uh, it, it's spread can. everywhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm yeah, making yeah. it better. Um, but no, it but, got but translated it, into many different languages, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's quite highly ranked. Like it was, was top 10, top 100 business books, whatever thingy. If you go on Amazon, it's still like sometimes a trending book. So it had, it, it, it just made, how do you call that? Like, it, it, it proved a point. And I think that is sometimes more important in an organization, like to say, mm -hmm. like, we, we're starting this thing now, because there's a book about it. And yes. Yeah, but it's important to realize. So I think it's an important point that to realize that sometimes these things, because these, this is really, in, in a way, it's really stupid. It's really silly. So someone wrote a book about it, gave it a name. And so all of a sudden it's a thing, really? That's it? That's all you need? That's all you need, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, at the, but, but, it, but life and business often is like that. It is it, it, in that in very superficial way, it, but it does give some people some kind of, uh, you need some evidence or you need some, you need some support, some backup, you know, because there are, were a lot of people and there are still a lot of people who, who want to do things differently, but they just need something to support them. So in yeah. that sense, it's actually quite a good thing. You yeah. go like, yeah, but, oh, here's a book. And there's a whole bunch of people from different industries. They're saying in the book that they're doing it. You go like, see, we can, so it, it's a support thing. So in, the, in that sense, it's really good. So it's like, oh yeah, you know, if you look at it that way, I think it's such an, you know, that explains the sort of the strength of such a, 
book at the right time. Um, and um, uh, I, I think that uh, we still, you know, I we still need that. And I think we were, to be honest, we're missing that a little bit because um, that had a sort of a, it was also a moment in time and, and there was this movement, sense of movement that I don't think we have anymore. Uh, at least I, I don't see it anymore. I'm not, I'm not part of that, uh, at, at least not as far as I'm aware of. Um, I don't have that feeling anymore, but, um, but I want to go back just quickly because you said to change your life. I just want to kind of know like, how did it change your life? your life life not your uh, like how did yeah. that what did it do well i'm i'm not working at the university anymore um that they fired probably, you yeah. you're writing books <laughs> <laughs> off you go go away <laughs> so it, no. it changed my life um to the better and to, to the worse uh in in some extent like um tell I'm, us uh the the so when i when i came here i wanted to do a phd that's why i started working at a university right and officially i'm still a student i'm still doing my phd at the university of <laughs> nuremberg um greetings to my phd supervisor um uh yes oh gosh it's 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 embarrassing <laughs> but so i'm I published a lot of academic papers in that years, and I actually got quite far uh, in the sense like I, I published too many papers and all, all I need to do is put that together into a thesis, which is probably the work of like two months. And I'm in the same state now since maybe 13, 14 years. So I'm almost done with my PhD since 13 mm -hmm. years. Katrin, I'm my PhD <laughs> supervisor. I'm really, really sorry about that. I'm <laughs> going to finish it at some point, but life happened in between. What happened was through the book, obviously, um, there was quite some interest in working with me. So I started, mm -hmm. I started teaching at different universities. I started doing consulting. I worked in projects and... It it all became really crazy in these years. Like I I traveled all over the world. I've been working in projects all over the place. Um, I learned a lot. It was fantastic. Um, and and out of that, then because I worked in so many different projects, I saw the common need to do journey mapping differently. And mm. what what I saw at that time was. When organizations did journey mapping, they used either design tools, like at that time, 2010, 2011, there was mainly like InDesign, which means it was not accessible. Like only the designer who created a map was able to, to do this. And then there were others who used tools like Excel or PowerPoint with really, really ugly journey maps. But I saw they've been used and reused and shared. They were accessible. So I said... We need to change that. If we really want to bring this into organizations, we need to change how the, the tool set people are using to create journeys. And that's why um, we founded Smaply, the, the first journey mapping tool uh, in 2011. And then we published it in 2013. And that was the first software which at that time claimed to be both accessible, like really easy to use, and creating decent journey map. A long story from there, but that became then my main job, like running a software company. Yeah. So that because of the book. <laughs> As well, yes. <laughs> yeah. And was, uh, you said it changed your life also for the worst. Yeah, I still don't have my PhD. Oh, wounds. Okay, sure. Oh, that's, that's the worst thing? <laughs> oh. Well, that's no. all. If, if that's the only complaint, it makes you feel better. Me neither. So, nah, yeah, it's all me, good. It's all good. me neither. Me neither. Never started. Yeah, it's just a title. Yeah. No, it really, it really had a massive positive impact on my life. I, I found what I love to do. I found my passion, and I, I, I love teaching. And and, and I, but Would it's rather not be what the, I want uh, to do. The, you rather like, be the like German, uh, the German computer guy. That's yeah. really. It's really what you want to be. I, I like to keep my my profession and business life separated. Like, I, yeah. I, if if I that, if I'm on the weekend, I don't want to talk about service design because no. yeah, like one of the bad things is you see it all the time with every service you look at. They say, "Oh shit, you can't do this. Why are you doing it like this?" And mm. and you can't unsee that. But and then at least I don't want to talk about it uh, in the weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I'm just. 
trying to think about this. I, I think I, 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 my dad is like, a, uh, he just retired, but was a safety engineer. So we'd go into factories and look for, you know, things that could be potential safety hazards. <laughs> and I remember there was one service trip that we were going to do to go help build some building. He's like, I can't come. I said, what are you talking about? You're really good at building stuff. He's like, no, I, I cannot come. And it was, he wasn't able to compartmentalize because he would have seen all the safety risks rather than <laughs> a bunch yeah. of teachers working with uh, power tools. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I, um, yeah, I don't know if I can do. I mean, I don't talk about service design, um, period. Really, <laughs> was there, no, was, was I don't there, talk. About, sorry, yeah. Was there ever a moment with the book where you're like, because I mean, you said you started writing this book not really fully realizing what you were doing or stepping into. Was there ever a moment that just felt so surreal, and you're like, I can't believe this is my life now? Yeah. Oh, there were a few. Um, I tell you three. The the first one was like we were we were starting writing the manuscript, getting people on board, like like starting it really as a big project. But we didn't have a publisher, and 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 I thought like okay, maybe we, we self publish. Maybe we we didn't like we we didn't know. I actually exchanged some um, some emails with another guy who was um, working on a self-published book at that time, which also became ridiculously famous and and, and oh. changed his life as well. I know what you're talking about. Yes. And and because we, we were like, like okay, self-publishing, how do you do it? Like, it was, was not really a thing there. And luckily, uh, I think it was through an introduction by Arne, I met um, I met Rudolf from from Biz Publishers. Bis Pub yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 Biz Publishers was one of those crazy publishing houses. I said, okay, that is a crazy project. You have basically your manuscript done. Jacob, because of his thesis, created a prototype of the book, and we we printed the whole book without content. Print one like like just one book. The whole content was um, I think it was. Uh, uh, a Goethe's Verta that we used there. We just printed some text there, right? But it, uh -huh. the layout was done. It was complete. So we put both in front of um, of Rudolf at, at Biz, and he said, "You're crazy. I like that. Let's do it." And, uh -huh. and and only then we got it published. And what happened then was the book got published and and it sold well and so on. And um, there were two moments where I really thought, like, what fuck is going on and one of those moments was i think two years later at the european design awards uh so jacob uh put it into into different awards like the the red dot award and some stuff when we won that and it was fine but then at this european design awards um in the in the book category we won the gold award like the best layout of europe in that year and for like jacob was 26 at that time i think it was fantastic the youngest designer ever who, who won this this award there and that was like a big celebration and at the end of the show there's the biggest prize of the whole event it's called the best of show so from all awards that they passed out they they picked the one that was the biggest thing of european design of that year and the jury of it, by the way, are all design um, uh, magazines of Europe, or the major ones of Europe at that time. And then we won this award. And I think that was a moment like goosebumps where we just, <clears throat> that can't be us. And then we were on stage and it was just one moment like, okay, what happened? What, what really happened here? Um, and the second moment where I thought like, what the fuck is going on? Um, <laughs> Well, it was in a similar year, or maybe one or two years later, at one of those service design conferences where mm -hmm. uh, there was a there was a dinner party or something. We were standing outside and and having a drink, and there were like a few other people around us. And then I remember there were there, there was this this one lady who then looked at my name badge and froze her like her, her face freeze like no movement anymore. Then looked at me like, are you? the mark sticked on i said <laughs> uh uh yes i guess so and she had tears in her eyes and i said what the heck is going on one, one of those moments Arna, what, what what you said when the um when the folks from japan came over you're like, like what why what <laughs> just yeah. a book come on like hello 
I miss yeah. those days. <laughs> strange. It was strange. Strange. Uh, th these were the moments. I thought, okay, what what happened here? Yeah. Yeah, and like I can I can understand if you're making like very personal art, right? Maybe somebody connects deeply with your art and it helps them through a personal time. But service design, I mean, it's all necessary. We all need it. But to have tears in your eyes. Yeah, your Morgan. Design, but like... you. But yeah. But you know. You know something. You're right. Of course, it's it's it's, it's crazy. But uh, I had those moments quite many of the moments like this uh similar maybe not tears and not i mean I, nobody cries when they see me but uh well out of misery maybe <laughs> no but uh no but seriously uh the, those moments uh were, were there um that you go like why what's happening you know this is not uh you know why am i here and you know because uh, is that me are you asking me to do this thing and um, so uh, it had something to do with the excitement around this uh, movement, and it had, no, it, it had nothing to do with service design per se. It had to do something with a, a time where there was a, a relatively small group of people feeling that they were going to change the world. There was something going on. It was exciting, and it were, you know. So it's. I, I don't know. There's something like I said earlier. I I miss those days uh, where you felt that you were really going to do something, change something. We're still doing it. I mean, it's not gone. It's not gone at all. That I mean, we're still doing. We're actually doing the work more now than we were doing it then. More impact than ever. Yeah. Uh, totally. 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 Uh, absolutely. But but there is sort of a. I don't know. There's a feel. It's me. I maybe maybe you don't have that. Uh, but no, there's. I, this, I know what you mean. And I. For me, I realized later, like what happened was we helped people in their career decisions or in their career paths. Yeah. And and it became very personal things. Like later on, people told me, like, th this book gave me permission to do it. We talked about this. This oh, book okay. yeah. showed yeah, you me a new way of working where I finally found my passion. Like similar what happened to me. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now we were able to affect more people through a thing like a book. And like, I guess the same stuff is happening with your podcast, with other publications, right? It's, we are affecting people. Like Whatever we do, it has an effect of folks. And if that is a positive effect and, and people realize, like, I, I change what I'm doing because of that and has a massive impact on their private life, I think that is yeah. really what 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 happened at that exactly time. and and that is to me the core of creative leadership it is giving people permission by showing them that other things are possible that they that that they didn't even know it was allowed or wasn't the, they didn't even know it was there so you show them we show them and through your book you show people sort of options of mm -hmm doing things that people didn't even know it was a it was possible or they knew it was possible but the book made it more possible for them because they're all of a sudden there's this evidence of like see you know i can be that and and then things and that really changes things and and you know same with uh, so uh, you know we we talked with adam um, uh, um, when was the last week for the podcast yeah. as well, where um, he talks about his uh, global service jam? It had a similar impact. This mm -hmm. kind of community of people, and I. This is maybe this is what my point is that I think we still have that impact, but is, but you need community to to be part of something that gives you that support and that feeling of, you know, I'm not alone. The social evidence, like you know, I behave mm -hmm. in a different way, and I I, I think we're kind of. Um, uh, and I spoke to someone uh, this morning. Uh, she was a service designer, uh, first independent, and then she was hired by this large company uh, to be their service designer. And then basically, they because they had no clue what that was. And then you see the same with UX a lot. Like people go into UX and they they become UXers, and then all of a sudden they're just creating like web websites or something, you know, digital tools or something, and they don't do the research anymore. And then so they get like. So I, you know, having um, the feeling of not being alone, the feeling of, I know there's something out there and hey, here's this cool group of people that are very open. Because also remember this, that when I went into sort of design, uh, design thinking, I was working at a design firm, design agency. Um, at that, at that 
in that sort of uh, design agency kind of industry space, everything was really close. It was like my clients, my my method, my world, my I own this. This is mine. This is my IP. This is my thing. And all of a sudden, there were kind of these agencies uh, popping up, like Engine Group and and, and LiveWork, um, uh, that were kind of saying, "Hey, here are all the tools." And, uh, you know, here's like, this is how we do things. And uh, we're just going to tell you everything. We're like, whoa. And I was like, whoa, we need part of this thing. And and so that that's the other thing. We opened a door yeah. and all of a sudden everybody could belong to it. You know, they could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, before that, you couldn't be part of something. You can, you know, so I think that's sort of where people go like, you know, ah, oh, you know, this, you made this possible. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I can, I, yeah. Exactly. So it changes. I think it's a it's a natural evolution as well of an approach, right? If you if you think of right. Anton and Liftwork, I mean they were they were even before like like 2008, like like eight yeah. years before that, they were trying yeah. to push, right? And yeah. they needed to raise awareness for this thing, service design. If we think about that, like the first years, 2008 or let's say 2000, if we include like um, like like. Academically, uh, Birgit Marga teaching service design in the, in the design school in Cologne and LiveWork and Engine pushing for it. And then a community happened. I think that was a time like 2008 when the community really started to grow and we became part of it when, when so many became part of it. But we were still pushing for the approach, still explaining what it is, still figuring it out for ourselves because it was never written in stone what it is. And, and thankfully, LiveWork and Engine was sharing a lot, which, which helps also the community to, to create a common understanding and, and, and big chunks of, of what you read in the, in the Service Design Thinking book is also based on, um, on, on, on their publication. I think their definition from, from both of them in, in our book and so on. And then there was a different time and a change from sharing a lot to a competition because yeah. What happened then for a few years was there were not enough service designers out there. There was so much business to be made in service design. Every organization wanted to do it, but there were not enough people who could actually do it. And we we saw a competition for for people. And and yeah. then, like in the in the last few years, it shifted again from not enough people to oh times are getting tougher right with all the layoffs that we're seeing now with the recession budget getting cuts so suddenly we see the opposite there are people without a job now because there are not enough jobs right now and and still yes there there are more than ever like more people than ever working in service design having a bigger impact than we ever had in public services and private services but also times got tougher i think that is why we see less sharing now um, yeah. however, there are other approaches coming up, um, like for the, for the last few years, I was, I was pushing, uh, journey management or how I prefer to call it journey map operations, where I see com like similar patterns happening. Like we are at the starting point where a community emerges, where people are doing it, where we start establishing, I'm doing a new book about it now, trying to, again, to create a standard of how we talk and, and, and create a common language we can use. And again, with the same intention, because I saw it happening before to bring this into as many organizations as possible. So it's still happening and just on different maturity levels, depending on the approach that you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's the, um, um, yeah, so of course it's still happening. And again, so I think it's also about language and and, and sure context. So things change um, for sure. So, I mean, the way we, um, you know, the, the, the way we talked about service design in the early days, obviously isn't, uh, makes no sense now anymore because um, um, we, um, you know, moved on and things like, for instance, journey, uh, journey, journey mapping, for instance. Um, I mean, I don't know any company that is not doing journey yeah. mapping in one way or another right or wrong i mean you know whatever they do but they do it uh you know they're they're using it they're using personas uh you know the right way or the wrong way doesn't matter but they they have the language you understand 
um yeah no i i, I get that the um it's uh it is changing but still i i, I also see that the problems with um that we had at the time you know, you know wanting to create uh the systems because basically so in service design there was also kind of a, a, a sort of a, a split at one point where you had the service design um sort of agencies and people that kind of move towards what i would say more towards ux um and then there's the service design that went more towards change management consultancy which were like the service dominant logic kind of people who said no it's a systemic thing you can't just go mm. and you know design a service and implement it you have to go internally um so that was also somehow uh that was also happening um and i and that's interesting because you know like i went more towards the service dominant logic kind of consultancy kind of world a change world where i started competing with the consultancies yeah. which was a surprising yeah. thing to me as well so it's also worth either so it's it's a really interesting i know you know that <laughs> i can't explain it in a podcast but this feeling of worlds separating and moving towards each other so it's colliding it's colliding worlds yeah. and and splitting up worlds it's it's constantly moving you know back and forth so, which is such a, uh, so sometimes we're kind of a little bit lost. We go like, where are we now? It's like, what? what? And because the, the term became such a thing, people started using the term like, 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 like service design washing certain approaches, right? Like yeah. people say, okay, we, we do UX design. We, we need a new word now and we call it service design. And, yeah, and even exactly. worse, like uh, cases like, People say they do service design. Then you ask, okay, what what do you do? Oh, we do it every Thursday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. What exactly are you doing? Oh, we meet and we put ideas on post-its. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, and do you follow up on that? Oh no, we just do it every Thursday. I know. So yeah. Well, yeah. So so my yeah. thing is that uh, that sometimes it's hard not to get frustrated where you go like, oh God, you know, it's it did it, it, did did we do anything? Did anything change really? Um, you know. Uh, and we're just human beings. We're, I mean, the, the problems are sometimes quite, but this is my point where I think we're, we are, everything is there still. So also the old kind of mental models are still there, you know, and we are still, uh, you know, there's still a, we might, maybe it's just a, a one foot or maybe it's only a toe or it's still in the first, uh, you know, industrial revolution. And I know we're in the fourth, we're supposed to be in the fourth industrial revolution or something, but we're in, in the first and second and the third and, and the fourth and probably we're in our brain. At the same level. time. At the same time. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. that's the thing. And that's confusing as hell. Um, and it's supposed to be, and that's the fun part, but we're all there. It's still all there. It's not nothing left. There's you know? this there's this um, indigenous people group that live in South America and they're split over three countries. So I don't want to say that they're only in one country, but typically in Western culture, we view the past as something behind us and we look forward towards the future. But, and so we'll say, oh yeah, I'll do that tomorrow. And we wave our hand forward. Like time uh. literally exists physically in front of us. Right. And oh yeah, yesterday you would throw your hand over your shoulder referring to behind you. This people group, um, they view the past in front of them and that they're walking backwards slowly into the future so that they can keep their eyes continually on the past. And every day as they take one step backwards into the future, it kind of moves up on their peripheral vision. Mm, that's beautiful. Isn't that wow. spectacular? And there, yes, was, there was one paper that this guy dove in and was like, okay, but how does this also impact how they communicate, impact how they think about things? Um, and he still wanted to do, of course, more research, but then he also noticed that their hand movements would be like yesterday and they would refer to the physical space in front of them. And if they talk about the future, they would refer to something that they cannot yet see. And I think that if we could also like, like you're saying the past, like the industrial revolutions, yeah, we're in the fourth one, but we haven't forgotten about the first, second, and third, and our brains are still in also those places as well. And so it's... Uh... Yeah, because at one point we were saying, you know, we're still hunter-gatherers, you know, you know, like that's a long time ago, right? But we're still that, I mean, in the, I mean, the, 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 the industrial revolution, that's not that long ago. 
really, you know, if you think about it, you know, it's not that long ago. Things don't change that quickly. We, but we, we, but at the same time, we were saying everything changes really quickly. It's like really fast. Everything changes. Like, oh, AI is like, well, ah, boo, you know, the world is different now than it was yesterday. And, and yes, maybe that's true in a certain way, in a certain level, but on the other level, we humans are still the same people. Yeah. We, yeah. all we need is, you know, love really. You know, <laughs> so, um, right? But it's true. We need to kind of our needs are basically about you know trying to we're trying to be happy, you know, and trying to be healthy. Mm-hmm. That's really all we're trying to do. There's nothing really more. There is nothing. To, there is nothing more. I mean, right? and we have all these things we do to do to to get get you know both done, and it's never done, and then we die, right? Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> sorry. Hmm. <laughs> that's true yeah pretty <laughs> fatalistic yes be true. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah but but it is true and 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 so um yeah i don't know what, what my point is there know, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true it's, that's it that's all that that's all i wanted to say not as much as we think they do like we're humans exactly. are going to keep being humans the world is going to start keep shifting around us but we'll always be humans yeah yeah and it, but I, I think it's important to know because sometimes we feel that uh, we need to speed up because it, it, technology is speeding up and i think technology should allow us to kind of actually relax <laughs> it should it should help us to be more human you know and we have to become you know as one person said in the podcast i, I think it was sarah we have to become better better humans who's that that again uh, you know, we have to become uh, better yeah uh, you know. adam yeah Oh, Adam said this. Yes, yeah. Adam, uh, which is actually uh, Christina Anderson uh, from uh, a, 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 a lady from Finland, um, who said that first uh, to me in a conference. Uh, she is the uh, 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 quantum technology uh, uh, um, IT lady from Finland, a robot lady, um, she, they call her. And so years ago, she said, the point is, we have to become better, better humans. Mm-hmm. Um, but technology should help us. It should be there to kind of give us more time, but we're with somehow it gives us less time. So you are the German computer guy, <laughs> <laughs> so, which sounds really impressive. Um, but uh, so what is your point on that? I mean, is there, so when we talk about, and I think about the future, but also technology, I mean, you're offering, so what you're doing, your company offers sort of support through technology, right? Uh, it's, 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 it's making, so the way I kind of, um, you know, uh, experienced it was, it, it made total sense uh, um, uh, in the sense that, um, hey, here, you're doing all this work, but you can't, you know, you can't interact, interact with it. It's either on post is on the wall and then some designer puts it in, in design and then, you know, exactly what you said. And then, you know, it's static and it doesn't talk and it doesn't live. So we need to make it interactive. We make, we need to make it kind of something that you can work with uh, and it becomes connected in some, in some way. So, but it's not replacing that. That was sort of for me, the, the, the cool thing. It's not replacing sort of the work you do together in a group of people. You're not doing it behind a computer. You're still doing that with people in a room with your posters, with your stuff. You know, you still go through that creative effort um and but then you have somewhere to put it and then it has it lives on right am i saying that right yeah but that changed that mm-hmm. that, that massively that's changed where it started right pandemic. that's that, that, that's yeah, where but, it started yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. You're talking and about the, the software? The, the Smaply software. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. still, I mean, I'm not going to even mention the Surface Fellow, which was also. <laughs> that was a great tool. But yeah, it yeah. was because that's so. Yeah. I just quickly, in my, in my brain, the <laughs> Surface Fellow was brilliant because your connection to tourism, mm. because I, I think that's where, because it, it, I th- somewhere there in your brain, it made sense and it made sense because of your, your experience in tourism. Simply uh, the way I, at least I played around with it one day was that you had a app on a phone and uh, that app allowed you, I and mean, now it doesn't sound that sophisticated by the way, but it was. Uh, it was 2008 the, when yeah, we, yeah, this, yeah. yeah, now it's like, duh, but then yeah, it was like, yeah. oh, wow. So you would go <laughs> on a trip and uh, you, you know, like I, you know, described earlier, a taxi airport, uh, you know, et cetera, a, a hotel. And you, so you can take pictures of moments in your journey that stood out for you, 
um, and then or you know a, a, all the touch points really or anything really, and then you could uh, take a picture of it or you could put a, 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 a like a smiley or frowny or a little story. You can add context videos, yeah, yeah, yeah video context to GPS that moment. Position. Oh yeah, GPS. Oh wow, we see. Oh, yeah, see right. It on so, the map even. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then it, we kind of you you put it into a computer, and it kind of generated this journey with pictures and everything, which was like, whoa, that's really cool because it's all of a sudden you have this. So you could imagine, like, for a travel organization, literally in this case, I mean, for any, but in this case, it was such a simple thing to kind of realize. Wow, if you're a travel org organization. It, it, you can get this data, just real people just going like this lobby of the hotel is horrible, blah, 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 or, you know, or something. <laughs> and then you go and then it becomes this journey, mm -hmm. right? That was the, that, what happened to this yeah. service fellow. So, yeah, it, well, it, it's actually my PhD is this thing, right? My PhD is um, right, describing yeah. the design process of, um, of what I called mobile ethnography. Hey, and right, I started yeah. with that in 2008, and yes. and we built a thing, and actually became a startup, and uh, and and it became a thing. But then, in uh, w with the pandemic, we had to close it down because there was uh, was not sufficient market, and it was always like the the side project uh, beside our main product, Maply, and that's why we decided to to stop it and resurrect it at some point as part of, uh, yeah. of Maply. But yeah, exactly. What happened was when we started with that in 2008, and again, like a big thank you to um, the, the business school I was working because it gave me a lot of freedom in, uh, in my research as well. So I got, I got grants for it, so I brought all some money in to, to do it. Um, and, and there was publicly funded a research fund to create this thing. And then because it was publicly funded, we provided it for free. So the first, I think, three or four years, everybody could use it for free. And, uh, and we had like cities being using it and, and asking their citizens to document um, their life and, and document like whatever goes well or bad. We had mega sports events where we used it. Uh, I think it was the, the Euro 2012 in Poland where we used it as well uh, for research projects. I understand what's positive on the, the, the spectator experience, what's negative and so on. Um, so it, it had quite a nice impact, but what, what happened was we actually established this, this tool as a research practice uh, called mobile ethnography. Yeah, if you Google mobile ethnography now, you, you find loads of tools who are doing this and, and there's actually like, it became a thing and now people are using it it's i think it's fantastic what we did there by, by yep. starting it and pushing it and and that is how academic research should work right you you experiment uh you test it and 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 now there are companies who are who are offering it and people are using it i think it's fantastic and what about smaply how did that change so smaply like journey mapping changed from in the beginning it was purely about visualization Mm -hmm. And that was like the, the first few years. I think in in 2016, we launched our second version, which was um, a, mainly about bridging the analog world and the digital world. Uh, so we, we included things like Smaply Capture, where you could take a photo of post it at the walls, uh, and then it creates a journey map in, in the tool, and then you can plot it out again, you can add more post-its to it, and so on. The core focus was about visualization. The, in the years after 2016, we then added more and more integrations to also show live data. We added abilities to connect journeys with each other and it became this thing that journeys become a dashboard and I like to call it an information system that helps organizations to take more customer-centric decisions to get an overview of what are the pain points, what's going wrong, and which level of detail. So building hierarchies of journeys and so on. We we pushed it with the tool that we launched 2016 as far as we could with the tech stack. At some point we said it doesn't work anymore. Um, let's switch. So we now have a new version, which uh, we soft launched, uh, which is purely focusing on journey management, or how I prefer to call it journey map operations, because I learned bringing in any approach that includes the name management <laughs> creates a lot of hurdles in an organization and language matters so much. So turning yeah. down the language and being 
crucial about how you call things when you bring something new to an organization is really essential to create adoption. Yeah, exactly. Um, people get stuck on language a lot, um, but, but which is logical because that's that's also part of who we are as humans, right? So if if you have a word for something, it has all this meaning, and yeah. and it and it yeah, and it, all of a sudden it's a thing. Yeah. yeah, we had a phrase that we would use a lot: words create worlds. Yeah, <laughs> and I was yeah. like, and I was a student, I was like, oh, this is so annoying. Why do you keep saying this? And now I'm like, in the- <laughs> like this is entirely true. It is. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I um um so how is it to be a father? <laughs> it oh gosh, it, it it sounds so uh it, another thing like you, you heard it so often but then uh it, it it's beautiful. I love it. It's it's one of the most rewarding things in the world. Like there is these there are these small human beings who just show unconditioned emotions. And that is mostly love. But some people also hate, right? And it switches between there. Like one moment they 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 scream, "I hate you!" And then the next moment they <laughs> cuddle with you, say, "Oh, I didn't mean it. I love you." Oh, yeah. it's it's a roller coaster of emotion. I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, if you become a parent, it's it's also uh, um, it's inescapable or something. You go once you have a kid, you're like, "Oh, I'm, I'm a parent." It's like, you kind of like, I don't know yet. No, it's like, dumb, you're there. You know, so, yeah. you, right. And you cope with it, right? Like, yeah. I, I think nature does the wonderful thing because the, in the, with your first kid, the first few years, I think you have constantly the feeling you are over, overwhelmed. You are, you cannot cope with everything. Like there's, there's too much stuff going on and, if you then reflect on that, you realize that actually the challenges increase with um, with the time. Like in the beginning, it's actually not challenging at all if you look at it afterwards. But in this moment, you say, oh, shoot, how do I do this? But then you realize later, oh, actually it was nice with this newborn that you can just put somewhere and yeah, it's like, for two years. Yeah. They can't fall down anywhere, right? They can't they run away. Lie there in the beginning. Yeah. It's yeah. so easy. But in this moment, you think, oh, I'm going to break it. It's going to be like, oh, gosh, I'm going to make everything wrong. But yeah, I think nature yeah. does a wonderful job there. Yeah. My, when my daughter was born, uh, she was born in the hospital uh, because we do home birth in the Netherlands, by the way. So my son was, doing, uh, was born at home, which I do not recommend it to anyone. <laughs> I will, I won't have more kids, but if I would never again, anyway, but you know, I don't know why we do these things. It's horrible. Do do I want to ask why? No, I don't want to ask. No, I don't want to ask. It's a, it's a, it's a just national, it's a traditional thing. We home births are like, that's what you do. You know, no, I mean, I mean like why you wouldn't you recommend? Oh, ah, I'm I'm not sure if I want to know. No, no. It's just because you go like, oh my God, what is, you know, because it's so, it's such a moment of. Uh, vulnerability and 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 angst really <laughs> like you know you're like you know something you know what if something goes is there a doctor here like you know you know there's like so as a as a man specifically because as a man you go like i have no function <laughs> i but it's so important I'm it's proud so, of i this has to go right this is really really important stuff is happening and i have nothing nothing i can't do anything i have no clue and so you're like you're like Oh, yeah, so, okay, all right, mm, yeah, are you okay, okay dear, yes. Yeah, Did your wife say no. the same when she said? No, my wife said, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it hurts, oh, God, no, oh. that's what she said, and i like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. No, no, it's anyway, oh, my hospital. God. Sorry, what? It's also going to hurt at the hospital. Oh, it was horrible, but then there was a doctor. No, at the hospital, they, they basically induced the uh the 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 labor because um uh because uh so the contractions so she got yeah. some stuff to kind of make her contractions go which is worse so actually uh, there was a screen where i could see it coming up and before she knew and i was like there's gonna be a big one <laughs> oh. and you're like what do you mean oh and she said like you asshole so anyway, <laughs> that was different, but it was a doctor. There was a peep, there was a nurse, there were doctors. They came in and like, how are you doing? You know, stuff like that. The, the whole, the, we were there for the day. Anyway, the point was that my daughter was born first, my first child. Um, and then uh, she was okay. They, they looked and tested. I was like, all right, she's fine. Okay. Here's like, and they were like, uh, all right. 
well let's here's your baby and you're like what <laughs> yeah, go you can go home uh okay um with the baby yes of course and we're like yes you can. <laughs> and we're like oh my God. um yeah we're ready oh yeah we have we have the whole stuff at home we have the diapers and thing everything's home we you know we try to read the book about it and and we're like can we just go can they no one's stopping this <laughs> Isn't we isn't a nurse coming with us? Like you know, we're going to explain this to you. You know, so there's a course first. There's a course. Yeah, you get your diploma. No, you have a baby. It's there. It's yours. And you go home, and it's like to your point, Mark. You're like, how do I? How, is this okay? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And how has? Because I'm not a parent. But how has being a parent influenced how you operate professionally? Yeah, because you were traveling all over the place, right? So, you know. Yeah. Well, luckily, like, the, um, th there was, that changed a lot with the pandemic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Before the pandemic, yes, I was, I was traveling way too much, way too much. Like, yeah, it was, you were. It was unhealthy. It was. We could tell from a distance, even from just looking on social media, like, you know, that's not, Mark, you, were, I stopped, you, you I stopped were, posting. You were in, posting on, you were in like, Japan and now you're in Brazil. That was like, wasn't that last week? You yeah, should, no. you're going to be tired, man. Yeah. And, and I stopped posting it because people like, 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 there was a time when I was sharing it. And of course, the beginning, everything is, is, is exciting, right? You're traveling for work. Woo! Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, they gosh, pay yes. me to travel. Wow! <laughs> and and uh, other hotel, another airport. Yeah, yeah. That's Southeast. the thing, right? You don't. At some yeah. point, you really travel for work, and then traveling yeah. becomes yeah. part of work. And and of course, like 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 not only considering the impact on on you, um, but also compare like like considering the the ecological impact of traveling. Mm. Like I. I I sometimes travel to someone's like, fuck this, we, uh, Zoom, why, why yeah. do I need mm. to spend a day traveling for something that we could do online? It does not make sense. And it, it has just a massive negative impact on the world. So I, I didn't want to travel that much anymore. And then with the pandemic, but, but the thing was organizations were not there yet. Mm -hmm. Like when we, we did online training for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now, but organizations didn't want that. Like they want consulting, they want you being present there. And yes, yeah. in some cases it makes sense, but I think in the majority of cases, it does not make sense. And then with the pandemic, it came all to a halt for, for at least an entire year, which I think really realized, where, where loads of organizations realized, okay, a lot of that can be done differently. And, 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 and thankfully, um, with the online training experience we had, uh, together with Adam and Marcus and, and this is what they're doing and so on, we also have the equipment to run really good online training. So it doesn't feel boring and, and like, there's so much shit outside there, right? When you, when you go to online training, it's like, oh gosh, this is so boring. This is so, oh, I understand why people don't like it, but if you make it fun and entertaining like a radio show, like a TV show, then people really like it and they actually prefer it to traveling somewhere for a training or for a meeting or for a workshop or whatever. And the same happened in, in, in projects and consulting. Like we can do a lot of that stuff online. And if you do it right, it, it actually has some advantages and you, you still need face-to-face -face interaction and it helps you to establish trust between people, to get to know people really well because you have this, this serendipity of what happened between the planned session that you don't have online. But you can minimize that and actually use a nice mm. mix of it. I think that happened. And now I'm traveling not that much anymore. And I don't want to yeah. travel because I want to spend time with my family. Yeah, same here, same here. It happened exactly the same. Which which now sometimes means, of course, like I need to work at strange times, right? I give trainings yeah. like in the middle of the night. Yeah, but otherwise it, you would have flown there. So I mean, it, that's me, the thing, right? Exactly. That's even worse. So uh, yeah, it's great. Isn't that great? These pandemics, I love them. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> we should have more pandemics. That's a lesson, really. We should have more pandemics because it makes <laughs> our life so much better. 
No, it doesn't. Sorry. If anyone uh, is offended by this, I am not serious. <laughs> but it does, but but but, but it did offer I, a really interesting thing is that it forced us all yes. to rethink everything. Exactly, there is which that is, is such super a super uncomfortable, lesson. super uncomfortable. You know, besides like the people dying everywhere and the not, you know, not besides adequate people dying. <laughs> yeah, besides that, the, like the inconvenient things of people dying. But but it just reforces you to to rethink everything and. um and I think that's also really, you know, some people then were like, okay, well, let's just go back to life as normal. Like, yeah, why would you do, like, why would you want to do that? Like, yeah. you just have this opportunity to, yeah. But we do also need then, uh, so like what Mark was saying, and, uh, you know, with, um, you also need to have people like like Mark, like Adam, um, do who can show that in this new space, in this new reality, where you don't, where you can't travel for a while, you can actually do things, deliver things yeah. in a way that people didn't even know. Again, you know, that is, again, also leadership. That's also saying, instead of saying, oh, now I don't know what to do, uh, and you know, staying with the old, is you go like, yeah, but wait a minute, we kind of, uh, we we can reinvent ourselves. Yeah. And I think, right. And so that's what you've done. You went like, but you know, because you, you already had this experience and you, you already invested in the technology and the stuff that you needed to create this, but not just the, the, the technology, but also the understanding of it has to be entertaining. It has to be, you know, the, the experience. Yeah. So we're, you know, like you said, you know, which, which, which to me also made total sense. What if it's, if you're looking at a screen, you're, you're competing with television, right? Yeah. What does television it. do? Right. So exactly. So what if it's uh, what if we can use this entertainment kind of idea that would, you know, in in sessions because people are they love watching television. Why would they hate watching uh, a, a workshop? Oh, maybe maybe it's just really boring. And, you know, next slide, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh my God, of course, would you like it? No. So reinventing it, redesigning it is sort of, again, it, it, it you know, could say that service design because your serve, your service as a, as a, as a, as a, as a professional, as a consultant, as a designer, as a business person, your service is creating that experience for the people that you serve. So yeah. that's also part of how you think, right? So, Correct. Yes. and I think, and I think in, in humanity's credit, I think when people have examples of how things are done, then they can get really excited and, oh, hey, he's not just giving me a PowerPoint presentation. He's, he, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's doing something different. And then they get really excited about, oh, maybe I could also do that too. Or, or you were even yeah. saying with the book, right? You put in, you gave people examples or put a name on it or, or were able to kind of, yeah, we're already out there doing it, but maybe you just didn't see the example already. And that when you can lead people in that way, say, hey, I'm trying something new and it's working, let me share it with you. I think people are really excited and of course, much more open to changing when they see that somebody else has kind of stepped before them, they can provide a blueprint. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing that excites me, but I just wish more people would take that step for themselves sometimes. Yeah. To try it out. But it's, it, yes, I, I totally agree. But I also want to say, like, a lot of things came together why it worked so well in the, in the examples we talked about, right? The, the books we did and so on. There was, like, a big component is luck. Just just being lucky. Just having the right, yeah. right interaction at the moment. And while you can't, you can't change how lucky you are, you can increase the chances for luck. And I think that is really, really fantastic. Like if you if you think of where could I be lucky and just open up your perspective there, say, okay, we can try not 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 put all eggs in one basket, as I say in business, but to try loads of different things. And you might be lucky with one of them. If you just try run, your chances of luck are small. If you try yeah. loads of things, you increase it. Yeah, exactly. But so, yeah. And then the, the difficulty is then when that one thing out of a thousand other things becomes successful, people just look at that one thing and say, I'm going to, I need to do that one thing yeah. when actually you did a thousand things, right? So no, it's not the one thing. It was just doing a thousand things and one of those things, which is a common, I mean, we all know this. I mean, this is not, there's nothing nothing new about this there's nothing this is like 
you know, trying stuff out. To, we all know this, especially, you know, but at the same time, we, I don't know why it's so difficult to be, for people to do it. I mean, I mean, I, I know it's easier for people to give you a recipe and say, this is just do this and then you'll be successful, but it doesn't work that way. But it's so difficult for people to kind of go just do a million things. And, and, and I think there are, so I think there is a difference between people where there are people who are, it comes easier to them to do all these things and people who are, find it very difficult. Um, they need to kind of, kind of be guided a little bit more, maybe because they're more insecure. I don't know because of content, I don't know, but I think there are people who it's the same with, um, people who, uh, in my experience, for instance, um, I, I would organize, uh, something like we've been organizing over the years, uh, um, something we called first at we call the unconferences and then we called it a uh, designer DNA, whatever meetups, meetups, meetups. Okay. People came, they loved it. It was great. And, uh, and, uh, people were like, yeah. Hey. And, uh, okay. I, you know, I left design thinkers uh, and, and, and obviously also because of, uh, the whole pandemic, uh, I stopped doing it. Um, uh, and then I recently, uh, I, 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 um, reached out to a bunch of people again, like, shall we go and do it? And they said, yeah, because I really missed it. It's amazing. And I'm like, then do it you know like so you need you know, what, who's stopping you from doing this like you know so i'm like no there are people who are organizers they organize stuff they do stuff they put things together they put people together and they they go like they they're they, they are front and they, they go and do it and then there's other people who, can, who will show up and they'll love it but if you don't do it anymore they won't do it it yeah. stops it, it dies like you're your, your tourism uh, conference, service design and tourism conference. I mean, if nobody does it, you know, if you don't do it, nobody will. People need for you to do, do these things, right? If uh, so, there's a lesson there where I say I, I think that you know this. Uh, you, you you know you need you need to also to have people, and if you are one of those people, you know, go and do organized stuff because otherwise it will not happen. You know, go and go and run things, go and, and come up with stuff and try a thousand things, do it, but don't expect other people to do it for you because they won't. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think that is, that is one of the essences of creative leadership that you understand that if one thing works, then probably it is because someone tried it a thousand times before and it didn't work. But if we look at culture and organizations, and, and, and luckily that is one thing that is changing. If we look at culture and organizations, often we only look at the one thing that worked, we try to replicate it. And exactly. anything that doesn't work, we see as a failure, we see as, as it induced costs or whatever. We don't often understand enough what is the pathway to actually be successful with something. And yeah. that we need all these learnings until there. And, and the only mistakes people can do is if you, if you ride too long on a dead horse, as they say in business, right? If you, yeah. if you invest too much into something without trying it, understanding does this work or not, and then learn from it and move on. But often we don't do small experiments, but we do big decisions in organizations. Mm. And big decisions come with big budget, come with big failures. Instead, we should do a series of smaller decisions that helps us to learn faster. And I think that is, for me, it is the essence of creative leadership. Yeah, exactly. Um, so last question. Um, um, I can talk for forever and we should uh, at one point, <laughs> but then maybe have uh, over dinner. Um, <laughs> so how do you see the sort of the future um, and not just of service design, but it's sort of this, you know, the, the, how do you see the future of, of uh, what's what's happening? You yeah, know, with uh, the you know, with, with sustainable solutions that we need, with uh, AI, with uh, you know, there all that stuff that's happening because we are still in the middle of stuff that's happening somehow, and you're part of the you know, kind of uh, that world like we are, we all are. So, wh what what is your sense? How do, can you make sense of it? And in in just a minute, no. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's, was, there's so much going on, right? And and mm -hmm. and work is changing. Um, we 
we we experience that ourselves like uh, we're moving towards a, a fully remote company something i would never have expected 10 years ago 10 years ago i was i was really like my basic understanding was we need the whole team together so we can co-create and work together and and so on and that was yeah. that was one of our core ideas uh, for this company and and then we learned no it's it's actually not true like yes you need moments when you get together but working remote is totally fine and 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 that is changing not not only in our company but everywhere and and, and i think people start to understand but that also means like how do you organize your private life if you work from home like like one thing is like do you have the the environment to work in right and some people don't like i some some team members work in like like from a shared flat and you can't work like do serious work if there are drunken students in your background right it's hard <laughs> so you you need to understand the reality and offer solutions for that as an organization and ai is another thing there like AI has a massive impact on how we work. It can help us uh, a lot and, and help you with like automating stupid tasks and uh, <laughs> and get faster done with stuff. And, and, and that's cool. Um, I also see areas where AI is applied in our field of work where I see negative impacts like... Um, <laughs> A year ago, we started experimenting with um, using generative AI for creating journey maps. And what what I learned is, if you offer that, people often just take what they what AI tells you, like this is the journey. Okay, great, we're done. And then they add like pieces of data to it. They fall, of course, into into confirmation biases there, where they where they only take into account data that supports the journey that AI provided them based on data from five years ago from other contexts. And that is really dangerous. So I think the, the danger of it is that you get really fast to good looking results that can be really biased and misleading. And I think what, what I see right now is people don't spend enough time doing actual research and, and really understanding and trying to build up empathy and empathy in a way of understanding you are always wearing your own shoes. You cannot wear the shoes of someone else. You can only try to understand to your, to, to the possible extent how the reality is for others. And for that, we need to listen and spend time with humans. And I think sometimes we're not doing that enough. What excites me to end on a positive note yeah, I was going to ask that. What excites you? Yeah is how much this approach of journey management, even though I don't like this term, it's the established term now, so we're using it. But it's the same thing about service design, right? I don't like the term service design. Still, I'm using it. <laughs> Every time you use it, you say, so you have to kind of <sighs> explain why you hate the word management. Because I, that's, what I, that's the story I told for the last five yeah. years, right? I yeah, always... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. need to explain why I know. I'm using it. I, 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 I know, I know. We, uh, as the your 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 fans and followers, <laughs> and so we all went like, "He's what word is he using?" Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, what? you're excited about no, no excited. matter which label you use. Yes. Um, I'm excited that finally uh, we're getting really, really traction with that. Um, so we see different vendors offering different software solution for it we see companies applying that investing in it we see uh, people starting consulting businesses around that and and finally we get cases where companies say yes we're doing it and we're we are in a state now where we are able to talk about this because that was a problem for the last years and that really helps us to bring in topics like customer centricity, sustainability, into decisions where, where we not try to change the decision-making systems in organizations, but where we offer an information system to do more educated decisions. And people will always do stupid decisions, but we bring transparency to this, so at least they become transparent, stupid decisions. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful i think that should be the goal yeah. for all of us transparent yeah. stupid decisions <laughs> exactly yeah that's right cool. okay okay um 
Okay, we're going to end there because I have, I have more stuff to talk about, but uh, we, we already are way over time. <laughs> we want people to actually also reach the end of these podcasts, um, which Take I don't know. Soon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Mark. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, no, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It inspires, uh, inspires me a lot, so... I, 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 yes. Well, if, if that is true for you, that is fantastic because I just had a really lovely conversation for the last 90 minutes. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>